Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Joy Collins, Section Chief of the Department of Pediatric Surgery here at Carilion Children's and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at VTCSOM. Dr. Collins received her surgical, started her surgical residency at Medical College of Pennsylvania, followed by research fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh. She completed her general surgery residency and minimal invasive surgery fellowship at University of Pittsburgh and a, surgic, and a pediatric surgical fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She serves as an attending physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the surgical director of the Adolescent Bariatric Surgery Program and the surgical director of the Intestinal Rehabilitation Program. In 2017, she relocated to Carilion Children's and brings with her special expertise in pediatric obesity, bariatric surgery, surgery, minimal invasive surgery. She's actively involved in medical education locally and nationally. Numerous publications to her name, including written chapters on bariatric surgery and thoracic emergencies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joy Collins. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, well, that introduction and humbled already. Um, so this is my first real talk on WebEx. So I encourage, I usually encourage in my regular talks for people to raise their hands and interrupt me so that they don't forget a question or a comment they might have. So please use the chat feature and I'll do my best to keep my eye on it as we go along and, and, and read your question and answer it. Um, I'm going to talk today about adolescent bariatric surgery, what's the rush, and this is sort of a part two uh, to the talk that Dr. Virginia Powell gave some months ago. And um, I, I say what's the rush because I think the question that I still get the most is why, why do you have to do something drastic to a child? Why not wait until they're an adult and they can uh, be better equipped to make the decision themselves and uh, and and perhaps understand or accept consequences of complications that might occur. It's big and it's life changing. Uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. I have no disclose, no financial disclosures, although I am a surgeon and I believe the, that the evidence shows that bariatric surgery works for the right candidate. And I will shamelessly try to convince you of that today. And, and here are my objectives. Uh, you know, I really want to talk about what it, what does it mean when a child is obese? And, and Dr. Powell covered some of this, and I have a couple of other comments to add to it. And I want to discuss the outcomes of medical management versus surgical management, and and review the the commonly recommended surgical options, uh, of which I think they are down. So. I'm going to tell you a few things that you all probably know. If you if you look at the definitions of overweight and obesity in adults, typically there are body mass index numbers used. And for lack of a better uh, system, that is what we have gone by for decades. It's not perfect, as you know, because it doesn't account for uh, excess lean muscle mass, et cetera. Having said that, I think it's pretty good for folks who are obese because for the most part, they're not going to have an excess of lean, lean muscle mass that skews the, uh, the BMI reading. If you look at kids, however, we look at percentiles, as you see here, and frequently uh, we will in older kids use BMI somewhat interchangeably because as you can see here, uh, class one, two, and three obesity correspond to a BMI of greater than the 95th percentile for class one, which is approximately a BMI of 30, 35, and 40 as you go up. I want to mention um, one thing you're going to see in some of my slides later is the term super obese. I want to apologize for that. It's something that uh, some of the papers refer to, and I really think that should be a class four. That refers to patients who's body mass index is greater than 50 or 55, and, and they can sometimes be a class of their own because they're extremely severe. As you all probably know as well, the original CDC growth chart is fairly misleading for 
pigs that are in the really high body mass index category because it can look as though their weight has been stable when they top out above the uh, above the highest mark here. But the the uh, Children's Hospital of Colorado group came up with the obesity growth chart in 2012, and it's very helpful because it's important to to know what's really happening. You know, th this this child here could have been losing weight. They could have been gaining weight. They could be stable. You don't know, and and I I find that that we have this uh, growth chart available to us. And, and this is what what the various classes of obesity look like. I I think that um, it's it's something that a lot of us can estimate. Not always, depending on the the age of the child, but but somebody in the normal weight range um, has a body index in the in the low to mid twenties. Overweight starts at around BMI of 25 to 26 and then on up. I see uh, a lot of children uh, in this category for uh, other general surgery reasons, unfortunately, these days. Uh, I have a question from, from someone. Is the obesity growth chart available in Epic? So it has been intermittently i can't always get it up for every patient but it should be and i can i can look into that i don't know if any of the pediatricians have a comment on that you guys might look at it more than i do um so ashley skinner described the prevalence of obesity and severe obesity in u.s children using the national health and nutrition examination survey data with bmi calculated from height and weight measurements and what she found was that um, there was a positive linear trend for all definitions of overweight and obesity among children 2 to 19 years old, particularly in the adolescent group. And, and this kind of goes against what was being discussed, unfortunately, after Michelle Obama's move campaign and a huge amount of investment in uh, focusing on childhood nutrition and overweight and obesity. It was thought that there was a significant improvement being made, but unfortunately, over the years of 1999 to 2016, particularly in the in the mid uh, 20 teens, that's not what has been happening. Unfortunately, one other thing uh, that was noted was that white and Asian American children had lower obesity rates than children of other ethnic groups, and as is typical of a lot of medical issues uh, historically disempowered are, are affected most. Here's a graph of girls on the, on the left and boys on the right, and the solid line is what we call class one obesity, as you saw in the previous slide. The dotted line is class two, and the dashed line is class three. And altogether, about 41% of all 16 to 19 year olds had obesity and four and a half percent, if you add these up, uh, met the criteria for class three. And her conclusion was that despite previous reports that obesity in children and adolescents has remained stable or decreased in recent years, we found no evidence of a decline in obesity prevalence. Another study in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Penny Gordon Larson and her group at the Carolina Population Center in UNC Chapel Hill looked at over 20,000 adolescents enrolled in the Adolescent Health School-Based Survey, uh, which was a national study. And the cohort that was available for the entirety of the follow-up included over almost 9,000 9, kids, uh, aged 12 to 21 years, enrolled in 1996 and then followed up to the ages of 24 to 33 years. Weight, weight, anthropometry, and surveys were administered. And what was discovered was that the prevalence of obesity um, for all age groups, and they, ca they counted only uh, Caucasians versus African Americans or white versus black students, and the solid lines are white kids and the dashed lines are black kids, and black girls had the highest prevalence of obesity and frequently in these populations, these are kids who were already uh, obese, there was a linear increase in their weight. And 80 to 90% of obese adolescents, no matter what class they were in, became class three as adults. 
and this is a common theme. If you look at our surrounding area, and I think this might is probably uh, an underestimation. This was a quick, um, a quick study that we did looking at patients in Carilion pediatric pr practices from age 14 to 17, and this data is about a year old now. But <clears throat> there are almost 5,000 kids uh, readily identified, readily identifiable just based on their body mass index of having obesity. As you also know, uh, you know, obesity creates medical complications in really in every organ uh, is affected. And we're and increasingly seeing these diseases in adolescents that were previously only seen in, in adults. And, and these are the most common. And I'm gonna describe and, and discuss some, some data from a few of those. Uh, first is, I wanna talk about type two diabetes. So in adolescents, uh, a significant number of those who present with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese, really probably the, the overwhelming majority. And a large number of them present with symptoms of hyperglycemia or even DKA as their initial presentation. Type 2 diabetes in adolescents manifests as a severe progressive form that frequently presents with complications, responds, results in rapid progression of microvascular and macrovascular complications. In fact, Adolescents with type 2 diabetes have a decline in their B cell function faster than adults. They have end organ kidney injury earlier than in adults and not easily controlled. Only two medications are currently approved, metformin and insulin, unless something has come on the market recently that I don't know about. But these and lifestyle alone do not provide lasting uh, amelioration. I, I feel like the endocrinologists I speak to and the pediatricians struggle with their diabetic kids for a number of reasons. Um, the Today study, as you all probably have read, is the only randomized study which evaluates the treatment of diabetes in, in adolescents. And the following complications increased over the course of the study. And this is with obvious uh, close monitoring and treatment. Hypertension in these patients increased from 11% to 34%. Elevated LDL cholesterol increased from 4.5% to 10.7%. Microalbuminuria increased from 6 to 17%. And retinopathy was not measured at the beginning, but was nearly 14% at the end of the study. So they, they concluded or mentioned that, for example, a 10-year-old who develops type 2 diabetes can expect the following comorbidity by age 15, and, 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 and these, these numbers are, are based upon what they saw in their cohort of patients throughout the study, and I, I think this is fairly alarming. Obstructive sleep apnea is also not uncommon. One third of obese adolescents have obstructive sleep apnea with associated morbidity and mortality, and the prevalence in adolescents presenting for bariatric surgery is even higher. And, and what I've found is that uh, the in-office screening tools and questionnaires are really notoriously bad for predicting this. Uh, these are used more in adults. Uh, I, I used to send all my kids for sleep studies if we were considering bariatric surgery, and I found a significant uh, number of positives. Obstructive sleep apnea may contribute to the development of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and really ruins their energy and their ability to participate in school. And, and life in general. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is a spectrum of disease that progresses from fatty liver to actual fibrosis and cirrhosis. And, you know, I, I feel like I see fatty liver quite a bit. Uh, you, you see almost true yellowing of the liver and the nice sharp edges of the liver get blunted, and I see it a lot in the kids that we do uh, cholecystectomies on, or sometimes even cystectomies. We're in there for another reason. Um, and there was a study called Teen Labs, which is a longitudinal study that looked at hundreds of patients who presented for and underwent bariatric surgery. And data is continuing to come out of that study. It's a prospective multicenter observational study. And they discovered that 
out of their patient population, 51% had more than four comorbidities, and 59% had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and six had non-alcoholic steatohepatitis when they were biopsied at the time of their surgery. And in adults, this is becoming close to becoming the number one cause of liver failure requiring transplantation if it isn't already. And the mainstream of treatment for this is treatment of obesity. Nothing else works. I, uh, one other thing, there are cardiovascular effects even in uh, young kids from obesity. And this is uh, probably well known to you all. It's a little bit of an older study, a New England Journal study uh, that was a population-based cohort study of almost 300,000 school children born from 1930 to 1976 in Copenhagen. And the coronary heart disease events that were fatal, non-fatal, and all together, and the earliest follow-up was 25 years. With their nationalized health system, they're able to, to achieve amazing follow-up. And, and they, they calculated hazard ratios for these, these cardiac events and they looked at kids from 7 to 13. And interestingly, there was a linear increase in, in both boys and girls with elevation of what they called the BMI Z score. And I think that the BMI Z score, especially in young kids, is hard to understand. Um, but for each one unit increase, there was a significant increase in the risk of a coronary event in early adulthood. And as an example, a 13 year old boy who weighs 11.2 kilograms more than average has a 33% increase in the probability of having a coronary heart disease event of 60. But what does that really translate into? Uh, you know, there was uh, a second study out of Israel, uh, data on BMI calculate, or BMI uh, numbers recorded for 2.3 million at, uh, at the sort of right at the cusp of adulthood, the mean age of 17, one-time BMI measurement, where they were then, from 1967 to 2010, and they followed these patients for decades, and their primary outcomes were the number of deaths attributed to coronary heart disease, stroke, or sudden death from an unknown, unknown cause or a combination of all three. So this looked at the similar outcomes from the prior study, basically cardiovascular disease, and they calculated um, the likelihood of deaths with 95 intervals in gray. And the surprising finding was that for those in the group that at the time of the study, 17 years old about, who had weight higher than the 50th to 74th percentile and above had a significant increased risk of dying from a cardiovascular event, and that the mean age of these cardiovascular events was in the mid 40s. So that means kids who were in this category at the very beginning of adulthood had significant increased risk of dying young. Now, I think what this makes me do is when I see a patient who's significantly overweight or obese, I, this is sort of how I feel inside. But I feel like this is how our community has responded. And, and it's not because we don't care. I think it's because we don't know how to have these conversations. We don't know what to do. Um, it, historically, what we've had to offer hasn't worked. Uh, so that's a problem that I think remains ongoing, even though we do have some options. Primary prevention is always the best. Even I, as a surgeon, uh, feel that that's the case. I think that what has to happen is, is, is that the, the individual, medical, local, regional, and national and governmental level, the, the, the changes that have to take place to prevent obesity are huge. And, and I, don't, I think that solving that, obviously, uh, I'm hoping the next generation can figure that out. We're not there. Early identification is also very useful to do health risk assessments and try to prevent comorbidities because we've seen that once they start, they are fairly virulent in adolescence. Treatment on the behavioral and medical side, is, and then the next are intensive medical programs. And there are some available, although very uh, sparsely uh, inpatient medical programs. And then there's surgery. And really, we, we do reserve surgery for when the other 
um, the other attempts at treat prevention and treatment don't work. Medications, I would say, uh, unless somebody can correct me, have been fairly um, ineffective. And, and until recently, unless I am missing something, only Orlistat was approved by the FDA and patients used to be used under the the, the age of 18, and, and I think that's largely uh, discontinued. I don't, I don't think a lot of folks are using that anymore, although I think that some uh, true medical weight management experts use some medications possibly off-label. Um, this is one study that is not particularly new, but, but typically has been replicated. Uh, this is a, a combination of, of five school-based intervention studies that included nine to 14-year-olds who all had body mass index of greater than the 99th percentile. And they ended up having an in-school-based, one-year-long intensive lifestyle management program that included nutrition class two days a week, monthly meeting with the parents, and phys supervised phys ed four days a week. And uh, these were self-led and instructor-led and those in the severely obese category had a 1.4% decrease in their body mass index uh, at the end of the, the time period, which wasn't very significant, but you can see that in the overweight and obese categories, the weight actually increased. So if you have somebody who isn't successful with any intensive behavioral lifestyle modification or medical regimen, surgery is indicated if they have a body mass index greater than or equal to 35, or they're at 120% of the 95th percentile with clinically significant comorbidities. Um, as, as listed here, th there are a large number of them. The, the, the bariatric surgical and obesity medicine community is looking at uh, quality of life as a comorbidity for what it's worth. It's, it doesn't, uh, rise to the level of being what we consider a clinically significant one. If they have a body mass index greater than or equal to 40, then that's also uh, an indication or what we call the baseline criteria. And these have been recently decreased by the Pediatric Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery Group guidelines. The guidelines actually published in 2012 uh, mentioned that a body mass index of greater than 40 with a comorbidity or 50 without a comorbidity was an indication. And as the safety profile and the efficacy of bariatric surgery in adolescents has been proven, these, these numbers have been lowered. And I'm glad to see that because you are getting sicker and sicker patients uh, coming to surgery with, with, you know, an additional of comorbid, comorbidity on them. The patient must and the family must adhere to recommended treatments pre and post-op. And there's no specific age recommendation. This, this, was, uh, this is a change also. Contraindications, sort of common sense things. Medically correctable causes of obesity are something that we don't want to operate on until that's been addressed. Ongoing substance abuse or within the preceding year. Medical psychiatric, psychosocial accommodations that prevents adherence to postoperative med and dietary regimens. A psychiatric condition is not a contraindication, but it needs to be uh, it needs to be controlled with appropriate medication, and patients need to be seeing uh, a psychiatrist uh, if significant enough to warrant medical treatment. Uh, patients, this isn't usually an issue for our teenage patients, but they should not be currently pregnant or have any plans to get pregnant within the year to year and a half after. In addition. Patients need to have attempted comprehensive weight management for at least six months. And if you look at the adult population, a lot of these three months, six month periods are driven by insurance. And the, the weight management is conducted by adults, primary care doctors who discuss with them briefly at monthly visits, nutrition and exercise recommendations, and then sign off on that. For kids, you really need something much, much bigger. You need a true multidisciplinary program an intensive comprehensive weight management for the child and the whole family. The family's gotta be bought in. It's not just the kid. And I have an asterisk because in my experience, uh, kids usually need a year or more to get ready for bariatric surgery after the point at which they're seeking, uh, seeking surgery. They have to 
have the maturity to understand the risks, and they have to have willingness and demonstrated ability to adhere to not only the dietary and exercise regimens, but there's a lifelong vitamin regimen as well. They have to have commitment to long-term follow-up. If they do not follow up, I really feel that close follow-up is key with the entire uh, multidisciplinary team, including the, the bariatric surgeon. And as I mentioned, they have to have a supportive family that is willing to go on this journey with them. As you all know, um, adolescents are not adults and they tend to have increases in risk-taking behaviors. They have unmyelinated brains. They're transitioning from concrete thinking and independence. And obese children are frequently behind their peers in transitioning to independence. In my experience in Philadelphia, about 70% of adolescents who presented for bariatric surgery were homeschooled and severely obese adolescents for a variety of reasons are 3.7 times more likely to miss school. So I think that that's important to know and hopefully can be helped. I feel that any program operating on an adolescent should be MBSA QIP certified and, uh, you know, the, the standard governing body uh, for, uh, you know, adult and adolescent bariatric programs. There's a, a specific accreditation set of criteria for adolescents, and that includes that the program must be made of one or more bariatric surgeons, a pediatric medical advisor, who's a pediatrician with special training in nutrition and weight management of children and adolescents and who oversees and coordinates the overall care. The pediatric medical advisor can be a pediatrician, it can be a, a, a hepatologist or GI doctor, it can be an endocrinologist, um, but that person typically is the one who sees the patients to begin with, screens them for medical causes of obesity and comorbid conditions. And in, in my pr prior experience, many comorbid conditions were uncovered that were unknown at that initial um, that initial visit. And, and then who, who has expertise in working with kids and their families uh, in an in a intensive supervised weight management over months. There needs to be a behavioral specialist, whether it's a psychologist, psychiatrist, or otherwise, and they need to be trained specifically to deal with adolescents and their families. And that is for the purpose of not only assessing the patient and family's appropriateness for surgery from a psychological and social standpoint, but also helping them deal with all the changes that are going to come about before and after surgery. The program coordinator, nutritionist, physical activity specialist, or special consultants as needed are considered more minor criteria. I personally think you need every last one of those to have a good program. Uh, just briefly, there are three uh, his recently historic procedures done. The gold standard is the root and wide gastric bypass where the stomach is divided uh, so that there's a small gastric pouch and then the intestine is rerouted so that there's a significant amount of bypassed intestine where the biliopancreatic juices do not mix with the food and therefore there's no absorption. This is done less often in adolescents these days and I'll, I'll tell you why and, and even the, the laparoscopic adjusted gastric band seemed really great because you implanted a device that had a reservoir attached to it under the skin and you could inject, much like you inject a port, you could fill this balloon that creates tightness at the top of the stomach. But these devices were relatively ineffective unless you had an overwhelmingly committed patient and there were a number of device complications. And then there's the sleeve gastrectomy, which is uh, kind of a more straightforward procedure where you simply fire multiple staple lines and remove approximately three quarters of the greater curvature portion of the stomach and create a tubularized or sleeve shaped stomach. If all goes well, patients will stay one to two days in the hospital and they can go back to school and other activities in a couple of weeks. And they really do, we emphasize frequent follow-up vis visits with the surgeon and other care team members. I will typically see a patient, even if everything goes well, six to 10 times within the first year after surgery. And they need close monitoring for complications, dietary and vitamin compliance. And oh, I should mention that vitamin levels are checked and there is a meticulous preoperative screening process. And I've been shocked at the amount, you guys probably wouldn't be, but amount of vitamin deficiencies in overweight and obese uh, kids. No surprise because a lot of the, the foods and calories they consume 
aren't uh, of, of significant nutritional value, but that is dealt with ahead of time. And then we watch that very carefully post-operatively. Body composition changes are monitored and, uh, and we look at their comorbidities and continue to manage them. Weight loss typically uh, continues fairly precipitously for the first six to nine months and plateaus around 12 to 18 months post-op. And I'll show you a little bit of lo more longitudinal data. Uh, from the teen labs group, this is where we have gotten most of our larger number data and larger number is kind of relative because we're talking about adolescents here. So we don't have the huge numbers of uh, procedures that the adult bariatric patients surgeons do. But initially in 2007, in the dark blue bar here, these are the, the proportion of gastric bypasses that were done. And in the lightest bar, these are the bands that were done for a few years and then abandoned largely. And what you see over time, and uh, this data is still being accrued, is that sleeve gastrectomy is becoming the number one preferred procedure in adolescents and, as I mentioned, even adults over time. And initially there was concern that weight loss and comorbidity resolution would not be adequate in gastric bypass patients, I'm sorry, in sleeve patients compared to bypass patients, but at least in early follow-up, three years of follow-up, that has not been borne out. The weight change from baseline, so this is the percent change, so the lower this goes is lost, tends to be comparable between sleeve and bypass patients over three years of follow-up. Typically at one year, that's your maximum weight loss and there's usually a little teeny bit of regain, but hopefully not significant regain. And in addition, these patients have had really overwhelmingly positive disease remission rates at three years post-op. Diabetes, pre-diabetes are probably the, the most successful conditions uh, to be treated post-surgically. Lipid disorders, hypertension, abnormal kidney function. Abnormal kidney function is actually pretty good, and sleep apnea take longer and aren't as easily ameliorated. A group from Israel took a look at body mass index after sleep gastrectomy because one of the other concerns is are these patients losing a lot of lean muscle and bone mass? And in looking at 25 adolescents who underwent sleep gastrectomy, average age of 16 years, and looking one year postoperatively, they found that. What they largely lost was fat mass, and that male gender and increased physical activity portends greater fat loss. So exercise is really important, as you can imagine, after this. But thankfully, there's very little lean muscle loss. And this is really impossible to read, but I'm going to talk to you about a study from 2011 to 2017. 60 patients underwent sleeve gastrectomy. And 13 out of 34 of those in the obese group achieved more than 60% of their excess weight loss, which is a typical um, way of describing uh, weight loss in patients. And this is over, over decades. Having said that, if you look at where patients started, their absolute weight loss was the same no matter where they started. So if you had a body mass index, or if you, if you weighed 300 pounds, you would lose about 85 pounds on average. If you weighed 500 pounds, you would lose about 85 pounds on average. Same here, weight over a three-year follow-up period. Those that started out at 350, lost about 85. Same with the body mass index. And what this really tells us is that Wherever you start, the higher you start, the higher you're going to end up. Those patients who were at a higher body mass index didn't end up getting down to the same body mass index as those who started lower. And that's just something that we kind of can't really control for. Uh, there are individual variations, but um, if you start higher, you're going to end up higher. In this study, the comorbidity resolution was excellent with sleep apnea resolved in 64% of patients at the end of three years and hypertension resolved in 50%. So in the, in the teen labs, some more teen labs data, five-year outcomes uh, as compared to the, the three-year outcomes, they looked at um, how the 
teens that underwent gastric bypass did compared to large number of adult studies from the adult lab study. And what they found is that as far as weight loss goes, percent weight change, it's very similar. It's lose and maintain weight loss as well as adults. And the adolescents are in the blue line here and the adults in the tan line. And what they found is that adolescents are significantly more likely to have remission of type 2 diabetes, 85 versus 53 percent, and more likely to have remission of hypertension than adults. So the earlier you work on these comorbidities, theoretically, and I think it makes sense, the easier they should be to improve. And, and that's that's been true in adults as well. You know, the, the adult bariatric literature notes that adults who have had diabetes for a shorter period of time when they come to their weight loss surgery uh, have a lot easier time getting off their medications and having resolution than those who have had it for decades. When you look at the complications, however, and other outcomes of teens with gastric bypass compared to adolescents, the reoperation rate was higher in adolescents, nutritional de deficiencies were higher, and mortality was about the same. I think that the reoperation rate uh, was higher because you had a lot of surgeons who did not do high volumes of these cases operating and the learning curve was steep. As I mentioned, this was 12 years ago. I think similarly, nutritional deficiencies were higher because the nutrition replacement was not as well established, the requirements for patients uh, in the teen years undergoing bariatric surgery. And, and the mortality was about the same. Uh, and the small numbers make this look relatively higher. And the two causes were there was a patient who had sepsis hypoglycemia three years after surgery, and there were two uh, uh, recreational drug overdoses more than four years after surgery. I, and I used to review uh, cases for this study, and if, if, a, if a patient had undergone a bariatric surgery and then three years later had an abscess, that got reviewed. So I, they were quite rigorous when it came to uh, combing through any complication that could be related uh, to the operation itself. All righty. So there is a surgeon uh, in, named Al-Qahtani in, in Saudi Arabia that has gotten a lot of attention because he uh, operates on kids of really any age who have a significant level of obesity and comorbidities. He uh, published his initial study of 226 patients where he performed sleeve gastrectomies in ages 5 to 21 with three years follow-up. And I will let you know that I have seen him speak and I've seen videos of his young children. These are not just children who are obese but otherwise doing well. These are children who are wheelchair-bound, who have tracheostomies due to sleep apnea and other significant uh, comorbidities. And um, this is a, a look at the BMI change, which is the, the, the darker line here. The higher the line, the, the weight loss. So they have a, a, about what you typically expect, 20 BMI points of weight loss. And then this is the height change. And this demonstrates that their growth continues. They had significant improvement or amelioration of all of the comorbidities you see here prediabetes, diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, hypertension, et cetera. 60, 65% of these improvements occurred in the first three months. So these improvements, these metabolic improvements occur right away. No comorbidity improvement was seen after two years, but the, the, re, the uh, remission rate lasted for five years. So nobody ended up with recurrent diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, who had had resolution. And his complication profile was very, very low. He had one patient who required a transfusion for postoperative bleeding and did not need return to the operating room. And one patient who was re readmitted expected staple line leak was managed with two weeks of TPN and antibiotics and no second operation. If you look at the um, if you look at all three operations and the weight that's lost or the body mass index changes at three years and the complications, I think it's fairly clear that the sleeve gastrectomy when, when applied in appropriate patients gives you the best combination of uh, less severe and fewer comorbidities and risks with comparable weight loss and improvement in weight-related conditions. 
Having said that, any of the procedures, even the lap band, can give you significant nutritional deficiencies in the, in the gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy, even though there's no bypassed intestine, can give you deficiencies in all of these uh, at the ranges you see there, depending on what publication you look at. And neuropathy has been reported due to B12 and folate deficiency. So these levels are checked fairly frequently and they are supplemented in everybody lifelong after surgery. Dr. al Qatani again in his uh, patient population in Saudi Arabia uh, published a paper in uh, with data just in patients under 14 years. And what he demonstrated here, the different color lines are for different age groups from 5 to 21. And the BMI change was similar age groups, although the younger they were, the less weight they lost. And what he looked at specifically as well is, is height changes over time, because one concern was that if you do an operation like this on a young patient, then linear growth may be negatively affected. And what you see here is that for each color line, the solid lines are patients who have undergone sleeve gastrectomy, and the dotted lines or hashed lines correspond with their, their individual color. And these are age and weight matched and weight undergoing medical weight management. So hash lines, no surgery, solid line surgery. And as you can see, the patients who underwent sleeve gastrectomy had uh, much more age appropriate weight gain over time. So not only were they not negatively affected, but they seemed more positively affected or, or more appropriate linear growth. Psychosocial outcomes are looked at in a variety of ways and are a little harder to, to pin down, but this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of about 20 studies. And the primary outcome was change in quality of life as measured by other validated uh, instruments and patients were nine to 94 months. And, and this is really all I'm going to show about quality of life because I don't, I don't really understand the instruments and, and it gets very uh, dense and in the weeds. But overall, at all time periods, for a follow-up of 60 months, um, measures of quality of life were above the baseline uh, that was at the time of surgery. And there wasn't anything that declined with surgery, uh, but everything did improve to some extent and trend above surgery. Having said that, I would like to mention depression um, and psychiatric disorders. Depression in particular is not something that is reliably improved after surgery. And I always mention that to families because a lot of kids feel that their depression is because of their weight. And once their weight changes, that will um, magically improve. And I, I, I in, sort of in, encourage families to really have that looked at, managed, and followed closely postoperatively. That could even get worse. So when it comes to deciding, do you do surgery or do you do management and lifestyle modification for longer? I look at the, I, I look at everything like it's on a scale. The downsides of surgery are that you have to have lifelong close follow-up and frequent visits. Even if a child gets up, gets older, goes to college, moves away, I think they need to have lifelong follow-up with a with a, a bariatric team. They have to take nutritional supplements for the rest of their life. I, I have trouble personally completing 10-day courses of antibiotics, so I know how hard it can be to remember to take medications or supplements, vitamins, especially when you feel great, uh, for your whole life, but they have to. There's a risk of surgical complications and the risk of nutritional complications. Having said that, uh, the, the alternative is continued weight gain. Typically, the 300-pound the 17-year-old becomes a 350-pound 25-year-old and a 400-pound 35-year-old um, largely. And metabolic syndrome is a price that comes with that, poor quality of life and shortened lifespan. So in my personal opinion, if it meets criteria, they really are interested in, in proceeding uh, I think it is in their best interest, and I think they'll have a better life and a longer life. Having said that, if anybody is ever on the fence, they're not sure they want to go through that, I, I would not pursue that until they were ready. Okay, so I, I have a few mock 
style questions here. And I would love it if at least the residents or anybody would respond in the chat. Um, and we'll wrap it up like this. So all of the following are contraindications to bariatric surgery except. Anybody have any ideas? What is not a contraindication to bariatric surgery? I probably should have worded the question like that. All right, somebody said, Eve, you're absolutely right. Age of 14 years is no longer a contraindication to bariatric surgery. Uh, as I mentioned, there's no age cutoff. Having said that, you know, we use our, we use common sense. I, I think you would be hard pressed to find anybody in the United doing bariatric procedures on kids that are in, uh, you know, elementary school at this point, but age is no longer a specific contraindication as it used to be. All right, here's the next question. Which of the following is not a recommended component of a comprehensive adolescent metabolic and bariatric program? Excellent. Chaplain, not needed. You could have it. And lastly, which of the following has not been reliably demonstrated to improve after bariatric surgery? Yep, the depression does not improve and could worsen. So kids who have it need to be treated and controlled. So, so in summary, obesity of any severity, not just severely obese patients, but even with moderate obesity or overweight leads to a significant health problems later in life, poor quality of life, and even years of life lost. Medical weight management is awesome, but alone, especially with patients who have significant obesity, does not provide an effective and sustainable solution for children with severe obesity. Mo modest weight loss can definitely be achieved, but uh, history and data have shown us that it's not sustainable over decades. Weight loss surgery is safe and effective in adolescents. Uh, it, it improves their quality of life. It improves their comorbid conditions. Uh, and a com but a comprehensive multidisciplinary weight management program is, is, is crucial as an ethical way of managing these patients. So, with that, I will thank you all for your attention, and I'd love to hear any questions. Feel free to unmute yourselves if you can and ask me things. Um, yeah, so I don't, do, I don't see the question from Dr. Lubin. I see the one from Dr. Cordell. I, I do argue for earlier referral for better outcomes uh, because I do think that the higher the BMI is and the more entrenched the comorbid conditions are, the less good outcome you're going to get. Having said that, um, I don't, me personally, uh, when I find myself doing these procedures again, I don't think that I will have the, um, have the guts to operate on, you know, the preteen type patients and things like that, which is kind of a problem, you know, because kids who are ending up having obesity younger and younger, they end up, um, you know, they end up bigger by the time they're at an age where they are appropriate for operation. Um, there's a uh, question of does Carillion have a team set up now? And the answer is not at this time. Uh, we have a lot of the pieces together, but there are still a few pieces of the program we would need to to obtain and piece together. And, and I should also mention that there are in in all the, the national societies, the, the American Pediatric Surgical Association and the American uh, Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, specific committees and task forces that we're all part of uh, that are devoted to uh, kind of research data and care of adolescents, specifically obese adolescents, not just as a, as a sidecar to the adult um, patients. And uh, yeah, Dr. Cordell, you said that the results over the five years showed a lot of scatter, large confidence intervals with many worsening. Um, to my knowledge, the data has not yet been pulled to see who is worsening. Um, although with teens and adults, but specifically one big problem that a lot of programs have is attrition rate and loss to follow up. Um, obviously, if there's data, then they are not completely lost to follow up, but but one theory has been, or anecdotal observation have been by individual surgeons in larger programs, patients who don't follow up as frequently tend to not adhere to all the recommended guidelines and then have some weight gain. 
and illness. Yeah, and th there's a lot of individual variation. And, and you know, I do, I do mention that. Um, you know, it looks great when you look at the line, but if you look at the scatter points, there's a lot of variation. I think what it gives kids is it gives them a chance. There's not a guarantee that they're going to lose 20 BMI points and their diabetes is going to melt away. It, it gives them, I feel like it gives them the best chance. If they've been working, typically by the time they would get to me in the past, they've been working for a couple of years with their pediatricians and maybe nutritionists. Um, and, you know, if they go through the true intensive medical weight management program, and and they and they have a good amount of weight loss and their comorbidities improve and they don't want to proceed then that's great but if they fail that and and they're interested in the risks which i'm very frank about then i think it gives some hope and the weight loss and the comorbidity improvement is what happens in the majority of folks um and we try to really handpick patients very carefully they undergo, they, they develop a very close relationship with the medical weight management, medical director of the program. They're seen by the psychologist or psychologist multiple times alone and with their families with a battery of instruments given and, and kind of testing done. If they have a, a psychologist or psychiatrist uh, in their local homes personally, then there's liaison between them and the program psychologist. They are typically social workers to help deal with uh, any social barriers, um, and and there's a lot of attention to that. But even with that, there are patients who don't do as well, and we we try to be quite frank about that. I, I do think, though, that most patients who don't do well, I can't think of one in the past where you couldn't a non-adherent, some some significant degree of non-adherence. And what we try to do is we try to spend a lot of time making sure that patients not only know what they're getting in, you know, they're going to be in for, but we, we, we have to follow the diet and vitamin regimen and assess their adherence for some period of time before surgery. You know, sometimes when the carrot of surgery isn't there anymore, uh, particularly if their, their mood or outlook can get a little low or they get disappointed in how their weight loss is going or how they're feeling, then, then sometimes they can slack off on all of those lifestyle changes which are admittedly hard you know surgery is just a tool and i think that it allows people to tolerate all of the modifications the drastic modifications they need to make uh not there's not an adolescent there's not a comprehensive adolescent medical weight management program in this area that i'm aware of um i do know that some of our um, local pediatricians see patients with obesity and do some medical weight management. Uh, there's a guy in Lynchburg who uh, see, PD, he's a family practice guy. His name is Mike Jones. He sees uh, kids all the way down to like two or three and also does adults in evaluation. But there's not, a, there's not a comprehensive program to my knowledge in the area. The closest one is in uh, Richmond. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your. Um, feel free. To anybody, yeah, people can email me or call me anytime if they have additional questions. All right. Sounds good. Thank you.